Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, a program note. Uh, it turns out originally this talk was called Machine Learning for Fun and Profit, and there are like six other talks that are X for Fun and Profit, so the title for this talk is officially changed for Machine Learning for Insert Cliche of Your Choice here. So I'm Chris Nelson. I'm with uh, Gaslight. We do uh, web and mobile app development. We're also doing a training class in Backbone and CoffeeScript in San Francisco in early December, so if you're into that, please check us out. Uh, but what I'm gonna be talking about today is machine learning. Um, let's see if I can focus or narrow that a Yeah, that centers a lot better. Uh, so machine learning is a very broad topic, and briefly, um, the way it's defined, at least on Wikipedia, is a branch of art it's artificial intelligence that has to do with um, using a set of examples or a set of data and trying to learn what the rules are and predict outcomes based on it. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different algorithms to do that. And um, this talk is really more of a depth talk than a breadth talk. So um, I'm not going to survey all the different machine learning algorithms that are out there. There's, there's quite a few. I'm really going to drill in pretty specifically on decision trees and even more specifically on a particular algorithm to implement decision trees and go into how it works in detail and hopefully give you guys a comfort level to know when's an appropriate place to use decision trees, uh, where they do really well, where they fall down, and how the algorithm actually works. So hopefully that's of interest to you guys. And I'll also give you some resources at the end so that like the other algorithms that I don't cover, if you want to go learn those well, there's some resources that I can point you at. Uh, but that's roughly the plan. Um, so just uh, to fair warning, there'll be some math. Um, I myself am not a particularly super mathy guy. I actually had to relearn some math that I'd forgotten to get ready for this talk, and that's a good thing uh, for me. And uh, I'll try to go through it pretty in detail, and, and I don't think it's, uh, you know, terribly difficult at all. But, um, uh, so how this talk came about is uh, from an actual project that I was on for a state government. And the project was all about recommending uh, home improvements to homeowners and uh, figuring out what incentive programs they might qualify for. Uh, so it had a lot of different rules about, okay, I should replace the heating system if you know I have an old heating system and this type of heating and this particular efficiency rating, blah, 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 then I might qualify for an incentive program. So a lot of uh, rules, and uh, fortunately, when we came to the project, they were already expressed to us as cucumber tables. So that was a pretty nice situation to, to be in, actually. We already had uh, customer written cukes to start off, one of the uh, rare situations that I've had the uh, good fortune to be in. Um, so uh, we started in on the project, and uh, we had uh, rules, this is like one of the very simpler rules that we had where uh, it's talking about whether I should recommend that the homeowner replace the pool pump. And as you can see there, um, if I don't have a pool, obviously that upgrade is not recommended, as you might guess. Uh, if I do have a pool and it has an efficient pump, then I don't need to recommend it. If I have a pool and it doesn't have an efficient pump, well then I should recommend the upgrade. Uh, so fairly simple. And as you might guess, it turns into fairly simple code. Uh, you know, I look at the property, and if it has a pool and it has an efficient pool pump, oh, that's backwards, I'm sorry. If I have a pool and it doesn't have an efficient pool pump is the way that should actually read, I'm sorry about that. Um, so this then is a slightly more interesting example. Uh, this is to do with replacing the lighting system in the property. And really this is kind of based on two different things. Uh, whether I have, well, what, the, what type of lighting system I currently have in there, and then if I don't know, how long ago was their lighting system replaced in the property. And that turns on into slightly more interesting code in that, you know, I look at the lighting tip type first, and if it's one of those types that I know, hey, I should recommend an upgrade, then I recommend the upgrade. If it's not, then I fall back and look at, uh, if the type is don't know, I actually look at how long ago it was installed to decide. So again, not terribly difficult code to write. 
and I had the cucumber tables to actually make sure that this code was right and that it actually satisfied the rules. But I got done with a couple of these, and actually my uh, guy that I did this project with pointed out that that number is actually wrong. I had two down, and I had something like 300 to go. Uh, so a lot of rules to write with unit tests, and of course a very aggressive uh, schedule to meet. So uh, a little bit of uh, sadness ensued, but fortunately I had an ace in my pocket, and that is I in fact pair program with the wizard. So um, I said to the wizard, wizard, what think you upon our dilemma? And uh, the wizard stroked his beard for a minute, banged his staff loudly on the ground and said, none shall pass. And then he said to me, and also you might want to look at decision trees. So when a wizard tells you to do something, of course you do it. And uh, that led me to learn more about decision trees, uh, which I had either not learned about in CS school or completely forgotten about. So I had to dig in and learn. And that's how this talk comes about. Uh, so what are decision trees? Uh, in brief, let's go back to that table. And basically, a decision tree is kind of a tree-based representation of what I would look at, the, the, de the decisions I would make as I went through and uh, kind of implemented this table. So if we just look at this table, it's pretty obvious what the decision tree for it is going to look like. It's going to look something like this. Ooh, and that's off the edge of the screen. That's so sad. But uh, not too bad. I can tell you what it's about. But basically, I look at the type first. And if it's one of those types I know the outcome for already, I'm done. If it's don't know, then I have to fall through and look at the last replaced and then make the decision based on that. So that's just a tree-based representation of the table we were looking at just a second ago. Um, but the interesting thing to point out, I mean, if I look at this as a human, it's like really obvious how I should build that tree, where I should root that tree, and what I should look at first. But as a computer, I don't really know that. And there's actually more than one I, way I could express the same table as a decision tree. I could also express it like this, where I look at the last replaced first, and then I look at the type. It's just that there's a whole lot more decisions to make, and it's just kind of silly. You know, I would never actually choose to implement the logic like this as a human. Uh, but the important thing to point out is there actually are multiple ways to build a decision tree for the same um, set of examples or rules. Uh, so of course, um, if I really want an algorithm to be able to build those trees for me, uh, it needs to figure out some way uh, to figure out which attribute to look at first. And uh, it turns out there is an algorithm that's uh, good at doing that. Um, and it is called ID3. It's one of the more popular algorithms for decision trees. Uh, it stands for, a, to look this up, iterative dichotomizer. I think that S could also be a Z. But uh, if you're a collector of weird words, uh, dichotomize is kind of a cool word. Cool, ah, cool word. It means to uh, split or to classify into two parts. Um, it's up there with amphiloskepsis in my book as far as weird words to collect. Um, it was written by a guy named Ross Quinlan. And what it uses to figure out which attribute to uh, put at the root of the tree and which attribute to put at the, you know, recursively do look at next as you go down and build that tree, uh, it's all about a measure called entropy. And uh, the way that um, I'm defining entropy for the purpose of this talk is really a measure of how much variability I have in a given set. Uh, so um, there's actually a formula that it uses to measure this. And we're going to go through and look at this. And so this looks a little scary, but it's actually fairly simple. And we'll go through and break it down and look at some examples. And, and maybe you're. Maybe it's not scary at all to you, but for me, I, you know, I had to look at this for a little bit and understand what was going on. Uh, but basically, what this means is if I take the entropy of, that, of the outcomes in that table, uh, how to calculate that is I loop over the different possible outcomes. And in that set, there's only recommended and not recommended. Those are the two possible outcomes. And then for each one, I look at the frequency of that outcome times the log base 2 of the frequency of that outcome. So it's actually 
fairly straightforward. Excuse me, I've got to get some water so my voice doesn't get out. So if we take our table again, and we can calculate the entropy for the result of that whole table there. Um, what we do is we take a look at the frequency of each outcome. So if we take a look at recommended, we'd show that recommended actually occurs five-eighths of the time. So we take like five-eighths times log base two of five-eighths. And then we add that to the frequency that not recommended occurs, which is 3 eighths, and then we time that by log base 2 of 3 eighths. So we come up with a number, and that number is about 0.95, blah, 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 blah. So that's the entropy of the whole result. Um, so entropy by itself is, is interesting, but it doesn't actually tell me which attribute to pick. But I wanted to show you entropy so that when I showed you gain, it would make sense. Uh, and gain, basically, is a measure of the effect on entropy when I choose a given attribute to split up the table by. So um, gain is obviously based on, uh, on entropy, excuse me. And the gain for choosing a given attribute, so the gain on that table uh, for a given attribute is the original entropy of the outcome, 0.95, minus uh, the sum uh, over the possible values for that attribute, times, uh, and the sum of the possible values, I'm sorry, that's not quite right. So I loop over the possible values for that attribute, and then the calculation that I do is the frequency that attribute occurs times the entropy of the results for that attribute. And if that doesn't make sense that, that yet, that's, that's totally cool, because we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail and show exactly what that means. But that's what the actual uh, calculation involved is. So let's actually take a look at that in a little bit more detail so it makes more sense. Um, so if we take a look at the um, gain for type, we basically go through each possible value for type and calculate the entropy of the outcome. So um, yeah, we can read that OK. So in this case, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, we take a look at pin base fluorescent as the first value for that attribute. And we see that uh, for both of those results, it comes up with not recommended. So I only have a single value there. And if I calculate that, it comes up with you know, the frequency that not recommended occurs is all the time, which is 1, times log base 2 of 1, which is 0. And then on the other, and then it doesn't occur at all in recommended, so that's 0 times log base 2 of 0, which I think is like infinity or something, but it doesn't matter because I'm multiplying it by 0. So it's a lot of math to tell me something that's intuitively completely obvious, which is that the entropy for something that's all the same is 0. There isn't any entropy it's all the same. So um, a lot of math to tell you what's intuitively obvious, but since computers don't have intuition, we need math instead. So uh, I do the same thing in the case of screw in, screw in incandescent. It's just recommended in, instead of not recommended, but the entropy is still 0. The same for screw in CFL, as you can see there. And the only entropy I have to work with is over on don't know. And for don't know, I have recommended appearing half the time and not recommended appearing half the time. And if I calculate that out, the entropy of that is 1. So then if I go back and plug that into my original equation for gain that we talked about earlier, I basically take the proportion of each of the possible values for lighting type. And for the first three, it's 0. So 1 quarter of 0 is still 0. And then for the last one, I have, oops, I'm sorry, it should have been one quarter of one there, and then the, it actually comes out to be 0.25. So the gain for lighting type is 0.95 minus 0.25, and the total there is 0.7. So a higher number for gain is better. That means I've reduced the entropy by this amount. Make sense so far, except for my typo over there? All right. So. 
again, it's probably, it, we, we already know this from looking at it, but now we have a way for the computer to figure out that it should start the tree at lighting type. And if we just, you know, to verify this, the gain for installed on, uh, it doesn't reduce the entropy very much. And the gain for installed on is actually 0 0.05, if you're interested. Uh, so it's obvious that lighting type's a lot better. So um, all this is really neat and cool, but how do we make practical use of all this goodness? Uh, so there are a few different implementations of this ID3 algorithm in Ruby. And the first one we're gonna look at is AI for R. AI for R is actually a gem that implements a lot of different um, artificial intelligence, intelligence algorithms. Uh, there's some implementations of neural networks, genetic algorithms, uh, and classifiers, which is what we're talking about here, and it has an implementation of ID3. And one of the cool things about this gem is it actually will output the code based on the tree that you, or based on the, um, the set of examples that you pass in. So we'll see what that looks like. And I'll bump over to my editor now. At least I'll try to. First I have to break out of that mode. Bump over to my editor now. See, I'll make that, sorry, make that smaller. I don't really need to look at the tree. So can everybody read that okay? So, uh, yes, I'm on the right example. So um, in order to uh, use AI for R, what we're gonna do here is we're going to build a data set first and then um, data set actually has a convenient method to load a data set from CSV. So basically what I have is I have a CSV that's just exactly what was in that table we were looking at earlier. And so I just feed that in here and it builds an ID3 classifier for me. And then I have a method that takes that decision tree and just evaluates a given uh, property based on it. And then I just define a set of examples over here so that I can take a look at what that looks like in IRB. So let's go do that now. If I get a top here. Uh, and then I take a look at what I call that replace lighting fixtures rule, evaluate, I can look at my example data, and if I use like the pin-based fluorescent example, sure enough it tells me that's not recommended. If I look at one of the other types of lighting, like uh, screw-in CFL, it tells me that it is recommended. If I look at, um, I don't know, old, It'll tell me it is recommended. So it's, it's doing the right thing. Um, but as well as just being able to evaluate an example, uh, I thought one of the cool features of this gem is it actually will output that code. So let's look at what that looks like. And I need to actually get at that decision tree in there. And then I can call get rules and it actually will output code for me in Ruby where it's comparing the lighting type. That LSEF is a little cut off there, but. Um, so if I actually have an object that implements methods for all those columns that responds to lighting type, I could literally take that get rules and do an instance eval on a property object and it would like, it would literally be writing my code for me. So when I first ran across this and started using this, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty blown away. Um, but uh, it turns out there's more to the story, so we'll continue on. Uh, any questions so far? Cool. So that's AI for R in a nutshell. So, um, yeah, we already did that. So that's really awesome. Uh, however, there's a rather large caveat with using the ID3 algorithms that currently exist. Uh, and in order to uh, understand that, 
let's take a different permutation of our example from a minute ago. And let's imagine that we take that last replaced, and instead of where we conveniently had uh, more than 10 years ago and less than 10 years ago, now we actually have uh, numeric values for the year it was last replaced on. Well, let's think about what it's going to come up with now for the gain of last replaced. And to, to think about that, take a look at what it's going to do for gain. It's going to take each possible value and look at what the entropy is for, the, for one of those values. And you can probably guess what that's going to do. Um, but what we're talking about here is something called the entropy bias. And the entropy bias refers to the fact that it's going to be biased uh, by default toward attributes that have a large set of possible values, or um, in, the, in this case, really an infinite set of values. Uh, and how this plays out is the entropy for installed at, uh, for any of those values, 1990 in this case, for any of those values, the entropy is gonna be zero. There isn't any. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna add up all that entropy and end up uh, calculating the gain as the total entropy for the set minus zero and that's going to be always the maximum possible gain. So it's always going to split on that attribute first, even though that's not really predictive of anything. That's not really predictive of an outcome. So it kind of falls over at that point and is not useful. Um, which, you know, made me a little sad, but I got over it. And how I got over it is I realized, uh, well, I didn't realize, I read and did some more research, and it turns out there is actually a solution to this problem. Uh, and the problem, basically, the entropy bias is really about how do we handle continuous attributes or attributes that are over a continuous range rather than a set of discrete values. And what we need to do is we need to discreteize those values. And it turns out there's a way to do that which um, is a little tedious but not particularly complicated. Uh, and what we need to do uh, to be able to handle a continuous value like installed year uh, we just sort all those values and then uh, build a list of the halfway points between each of those values and then measure the gain from splitting on that point of each of those. And basically, we look at the gain from each possible split point and the gain with the highest split point wins. And all of a sudden now we have a split point and we can just discreteize every row into is it less than the split point or more than the split point. So now we are like are back in business as far as like the rest of the algorithm goes. So um, kind of cool. Uh, unfortunately that AI for our ID3 implementation does not implement this feature. Uh, this actually, this algorithm actually comes from the same guy who did ID3. He actually did a later algorithm called C4.5 uh, I don't know why it's called that. Maybe C is for continuous, but I'm really just making that up. Um, but one of the cool things that it does have in that algorithm, along with some other improvements, is what we talked about, being able to handle continuous attributes. So that's pretty cool. Um, and it turns out there is an implementation of this in Ruby by a guy, Ilya Grigoric, who um, he's spoken at some Ruby conferences, super smart guy. Um, if you have a chance to talk to him, you should. Uh, I don't think he's here, or at least I didn't see his name giving any talks. Um, but anyway, uh, he did a gem called Decision Tree, uh, obviously enough, conveniently enough. And uh, it has some nice features. One of the features is that it can actually output the tree that it builds graphically, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and it also, more importantly maybe, it deals with continuous attributes correctly. And just sort of as like a side little fun thing, it happens to add an entropy method to the array class. So as I was prepping for this talk and like doing these entropy calculations, I could just like build an array and do well, you know, array.entropy and it would return a value. So um, I don't know if it's all that practical unless you're giving a talk on entropy, but it's still pretty cool. Um, so let's see that in action. And we'll jump out of here.
Oh, I should probably start with the code for decision tree example first, so it makes sense. Um, so this is using the decision tree gem. Uh, it's a little bit more work to set up initially in that I have to take that um, two-dimensional array I get back from parsing my CSV myself, and I have to pop off the labels, and I have to drop the last result in there. So the labels in this case are lighting type, install that result. Well, really, only the labels for attributes are the ones I want. So I drop result off the end, and then I just have lighting type and install that in that labels array. Uh, and then the other thing I need to do is munge my data a little bit. They're all strings as coming back from uh, parsing the CSV, so I convert the ones that are all numbers into actual numbers. Uh, it's a little cut off, but there's like a 2i over there at the end. So just a little bit of data munging, not much. And then at that point, I'm ready to feed into the decision tree ID3 guy, uh, the labels, the data itself, a default value, and a config object. And that config object is all about telling it what columns to treat as discrete columns and what columns to treat, or attributes rather, what attributes are discrete and what attributes are continuous. If you've ever looked at this gem, uh, that config thing is like brand new. Um, that's in like 0.4. It'll you just uh, bump that gem version. Um, but so I can tell it that the lighting type's discrete, last replace is continuous. And uh, then I set up some example data, and I'm in business. So now let's see that work. I have a tree, and tree has a predict method. And I again can look at my example data, run pin based fluorescent, and it's not recommended. Screw in CFL is recommended. And we can see it's working just as it did before. Uh, so I also told you that there's a feature there. Oh, yeah, so um, if we look at array here, we can actually get the entropy. Oh, if I can type. So that's kind of cool. And then the last cool feature is really that uh, tree.graph. I dump that to RubyConf. It dumps out a PNG file for me. And among other things, that'll let me see exactly what it did as far as building that tree. So it's split on lighting type just the way it should. And then it figured out that based on the set of data that I have, the split point is 2003.5. So originally I had 10 years ago, so it's like really close. And if I gave it more examples, it would get closer and, and eventually exactly get to 10 years ago. So, um, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I really had to say about that implementation decision tree. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, so, the last section really is about um, whether I have rules or whether I have examples. And um, to show it, so decision trees in general, they're really good at taking lots of examples and referring, inferring rules from them. But uh, in our case, as we got farther along in this project, what we realized is we actually had the rules themselves and we didn't need something uh, really as complicated as, as the decision tree algorithms we were looking at. And to show you what I mean, let's look at one of the later rules that we had to implement. Oh, and that's a little bit cut off, but I think it's enough there that I can show what's going on. So what we really had for some of these later rules is uh, kind of a more simplified just table of um, if it's electric resistance, um, none of those other values, none of those other attributes matter. If the type is electric, electric resistance, the outcome's not recommended. Um, the same for some of those examples later on. 
basically any time I have a space in that table, what that means is that attribute for that row doesn't matter. So um, out of the box, and, and there might be a way, I've talked about this a little bit with other people, there might be a way to adapt the decision tree algorithms to be able to do, deal with these blank values for attributes in this table, but out of the box, it doesn't know how to deal with this. Uh, but what I realized is the decision tree algorithms are really all about trying to figure out what decisions to do first. And in a situation like this, you can actually use a really simple brute force support, a, approach where basically you just go down, you start with your example, and you just step down this table and do compares at each row. And the first time you find a match, that's the outcome and you're done. So um, I didn't actually need decision tree quite, although you know, learning about them and figuring out where to apply them was very cool and I enjoyed it. Um, I actually had a simpler problem, so um, I, I looked around and there might have been an implementation that did what I wanted already, but it was just so simple that I ended up writing a gem to do this myself and I called this decision table, because it's not really a decision tree algorithm per se. Uh, and it's really for where you have rules expressed in a tabular format rather than a bunch of examples that you need to learn the rules from. And the key point is you already know what order to do the comparisons. That's what those algorithms are really figuring out is what order to do the, co the, the comparisons. And if you already know, you can just use a simple brute force approach like I did. So we can uh, look at this as well. We'll bop over to uh, the decision table example. And decision table, again, can operate from, uh, well, really a two-dimensional array that I'm parsing from CSV. And I have a simplified space heating CSV that is basically exactly that table that I looked at with the space heating. Um, and I feed that to my decision table rule set and then at that point I'm ready to run my example data through it. And uh, I have an evaluate, me evaluate method just like I did uh, for the first day FRR example, I guess. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have a different uh, set of examples in this case. Um, so I think I have a gas furnace efficient. And in that case, if it's already an efficient gas furnace, it won't recommend I replace it. If I have an inefficient gas furnace, it will. If I don't know, but it was replaced a long time ago, it'll recommend it. So uh, it's working. Oops. What happened here? Sorry about that. Uh, so it's working just as I expect. Um, and it's just a, a simpler brute force kind of approach for when I need that. So to kind of summarize some of the things I learned through all this, and, uh, and the, the first thing is that if you have a situation like this where you have rules that are expressed like this to you from the customer in a tabular format, um, don't you know, write all the code yourself. You don't need to do that. Uh, there are several approaches that will work. Either the, um, if you have examples and you need to infer the rules, um, something like ID3 or the, the decision tree is gem is a great way to go. Uh, if what you really have is just a table of the rules that uh, you can use something like decision table and turn that into a DSL, essentially. Um, but what's really, really helpful is in our situation, we wrote a few of them by hand, and then we had the test cases so that when we were, when we were ready to replace it with the, uh, the decision tree algorithm or the decision table, uh, we were able to verify that it was still working as expected. So in this case, the unit tests were actually more valuable than the implementation code because they allowed us to replace the implementation code with something better. So uh, really strong uh, case for unit tests. Uh, 
The other thing is you really need to understand the algorithms and what they're good for and when they uh, fall down. Um, initially, when I started looking at decision trees, uh, they just sort of looked like a wonderful magic black box that would write my code for me. And as I dug in some more, it turned out the answer was maybe, kind of. Um, but it's really important to understand how these things work rather than just plugging them in. And of course, the last thing is the simplest thing that can possibly work is always a good choice. So um, some resources to look at. Uh, igvita.com is Ilya's website. There's a bunch of good blog posts on different other uh, AI algorithms to look at. And uh, he goes into detail on things like Bayesian classification and um, singular vector distribution. I'm, I think I'm getting those words wrong, but lots of different algorithms that are worth looking at. Um, there's also a really good uh, discussion of ID3 with an implementation in Python. And uh, last but not least, um, I actually have all my slides available on GitHub. This whole thing is done in uh, Reveal.js. Uh, so um, I don't know how much time I have left, but it looks like, yeah, I do have a few minutes for questions if there are any. So uh, the, using a, the decision trees can uh, it handle noise in the frame data. Like if you have a few incorrect uh, results <coughs> in there, will it kind of deal with that if you have enough data, or will that possibly cause a converge? You know what? I'd have to I'd have to give that a try and find out. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Oh, I'm sorry. To repeat the question, would it deal with noise in the data? Uh, would it figure out that if you had some values, that some rows that were incorrect, would it be able to figure that out? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I think if the values vary and you can tell it, you know, what was passed or failed again, it would learn. I think it would. I think it would have a better chance if it was a continuous attribute than it was if, if it was a discrete attribute of, of continuing on and working through that situation. I don't know what it would do if it was a discrete attribute that it had like a, you know, an outcome that was wrong. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. The question was on a pruning, pruned or unpruned decision trees, and I do not know the answer to that. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, thanks a lot. <laughs>